Please open your Bibles this morning to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, we'll be reading verse 32. Luke 12, 32. Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Good to see each of you this morning. It's always a pleasure to have the opportunity to stand before you. It's good to be home, number one. Number two, for the opportunity to preach and teach the gospel uh, to the congregation here at, at Luxahoma. It's a, it's a privilege and certainly an honor that I get to stand here. Um, you can choose any man that you would like to stand in this place on a, any given day any given first day of the week, and yet I get that opportunity, and I'm eternally grateful. I do want to mention to you a couple of things. This has more to do with the men of the congregation, and maybe, uh, ladies, you can in encourage our men. Uh, but I want to put it before you. We began sending out advertisements. The congregation here is going to have a men's day. On January the 20th, that's going to be from 9 a.m. in the morning till 12 noon. There will be lunch following the, uh, the men's day. We have invited men from area congregations. We're going to continue to send out advertisements as the time gets closer. The second one will go out this week. But uh, we're going to have a man here by the name of Bobby Liddell, who's no stranger to this congregation. He's going to come and he's going to speak on leadership in the home and leadership in the church. And so certainly we're grateful for him accepting our invitation to come here. But we need all of our men here in this congregation to be here. Uh, it would be a great encouragement not only to each other, but a great encouragement to those who will come and visit us and so we want to uh, be the leaders in our homes and the leaders in the church and so we want to take advantage of this opportunity also uh, there is going to be an elders preachers and deacons meeting uh, that is going to be next Sunday afternoon that's December the 10th and that'll be following the afternoon uh, worship service so uh, all of our preachers and elders and deacons uh, will begin to mark our calendars so that we will be here uh, for that meeting as well. There was a little boy that when he was seven years old, he was about to start his first day of school. Has he prepared that morning putting on the clothes that his mother had spent money to buy, as this being a most special day. She goes into his bedroom and finds that he's dressed. He has everything that he needs to begin to start this new journey in his life. And she asks him, what are you waiting for? And he says, I'm afraid. And she said, what are you afraid of? And he says, I don't know. I've never done this before. I've seen it. But I've never done it. Later on in life, when he was about 16 years old, his father began to teach him how to drive an automobile. And he would sit next to his son as his son would get into that small little truck. And he would begin going down the road and shifting all five gears. About a month later, he was ready to take his driver exam. So he took the exam and then the driving test. And then he goes and he sits in the front seat and the instructor comes around to the other side, and he pauses for just a moment. And she says, 
What are you afraid of? He said, I don't know. Jump ahead, he's 21 years old. And he's sitting in a room with his dad, with his brother. And the woman that he's going to spend the rest of his life with is about to make her appearance in a church building. They've already been given notice that she should be in the very front of the auditorium by this point, and he hesitates. So his dad asks him, what are you afraid of? I said, I don't know. Fear can be a paralyzing thing. Fear can keep us from going places, making right decisions. Fear can keep us from advancing from anything from knowledge to skill. But fear is one of those things that all men everywhere are going to have to overcome if they're going to be a child of God. If they're going to serve faithfully the one true and living God. The text that was read for us a moment ago is the tail end of a scene where Jesus had just been a guest of a Pharisee who had offered a supper of which he failed to wash according to the Jewish tradition. And he was questioned concerning those things. And even as the conversation would go along, that there would be anxiety, worry, concern about the future. What are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? How are we going to be able to be sustained? How are we going to take care of ourselves? Surely there will be a way for us to put a roof over our head and be able to take the next step of whatever journey or opportunity may be before us. And Jesus offers these words when he approaches his disciples and told them to fear not, little flock. The idea of little flock there is the, is the mode of compassion and concern that a shepherd truly would have for his sheep. And when you can consider the end of the phrase here that he says that it is his pleasure to give us the kingdom. That he's already looking past the physical future and allowing them to see a spiritual future. That should not be your concern, because God is always going to take care of those things, because he said in the Sermon on the Mount, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things, all of the food, clothing, shelter, they'll take care of themselves. But you fear not, little flock, because it's my pleasure to give you the kingdom. You know, fear has played havoc on our societies, on humanity. It even has plagued the church of our Lord in so many ways. And because it has, the work of the Lord has been hindered, sometimes it has come to a complete stall. But it will always start with the individual and his own fear. And may I say that fear is contagious. Fearing something maybe of the unknown. Fearing something where you and I cannot predict or even see the future can keep us from going as far as we need to go. Think about the individual who has just had a Bible study 
and faced with the decision as to whether or not they're going to obey the gospel, the fear comes along, and the fact is that this may separate me from everyone I know and love, my family. This may separate me from a job that I love because being a faithful child of God is going to require of me to do things that I've never done before. That it may even require me to be separated or to give up the things in which has brought me so much pleasure and joy over the years. And to even think about that brings me fear. You know, in the Bible, some 63 times you read the phrase, fear not. But also in the Bible, you read some 28 times, be not afraid. And when you take into consideration that God has given us those phrases throughout Scripture, Every single one of them is attached to his will. That the people to whom he's speaking, that they would have to see for themselves a connection with what they're about to face and the God who will see them through it. God doesn't want his children to live in fear, but rather he wants them to be Courageous. In Joshua chapter 1, verse number 9, God encouraged Joshua as this new chosen leader of Israel. And he says, have I not commanded thee? Be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid. Be not dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. And you take into consideration that you bring a New Testament example or principle of that found in Hebrews chapter 13, where there the promise of God is that I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. And going back and looking at the original language, the connotation of this actually written out in a literal form, would be, I will never, 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 never leave thee, nor forsake thee. What are you afraid of? You can make your own list. I have mine. It doesn't mean that this life is always going to be absent of fear, But fear cannot be a controlling factor of what you and I do as children of God. Sometimes when you look at the Lord's church today, you can begin to see that there's fear in the leadership. All you have to do is bring up budget. And for some leaderships in the Lord's church... They'll look at it and say, I don't know how we're going to make it. For some, you look at the office of a deacon and some of these individuals are are fearful simply because they, they don't know exactly what they're supposed to be doing because they haven't had the guidance. Maybe they haven't just had the direct statement of where they need to be at whatever given time. Sometimes it's the preachers who are afraid that they're going to offend somebody when they stand in the pulpit and have to say something controversial considering the world, or it's just the fact that they have to deal with a particular sin that points to maybe just one person in the congregation. And so he might live in fear. It might cost him his job, his livelihood. But then again, it might cost him his relationship with God if he fails to do it. For the member, it can just simply be the fact is that I don't know where my place is. 
The fact is that I don't know exactly what it is I'm supposed to be doing. It may be just the fact that I'm, I'm fearing the future in the sense that I don't know where I'm going when this life is over. Is there a better definition of misery when we live in fear? This morning, I want us to take and look at this lesson and look at two different kinds of fear. Number one, the fear that God commands. But also, I want us to look at the fear that God condemns. Before we do that, I want us to see how the Bible defines fear. When you look at the Webster's Dictionary, the most current one even includes God in the definition. The word fear means alarm, dread, solitude, anxiety, reverence of God. In the Old Testament, there's two commonly used words. There's more than two, but that's translated fear in our English Bibles. But the two most common, both of them can indicate being afraid or standing in awe of something supreme. When you think about these words, you think about in Genesis chapter 32 and verse 11, where Esau's escaping the death hand of his brother. And he says, deliver me, I pray thee, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, lest he will come and smite me and the mother with the children. Genesis 32 and verse 11. Obviously, the word more there, the idea of being fearful and afraid. But then you have the the. The blessings of the, of the next term, when you look at Genesis chapter 22 and verse 12, when, when Abraham is about to slay his only son, as he lifts his arm in the air with the, with the stabbing instrument in his hand, that he's about to slay his son, and God says, Lay not thy hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him, for I know that thou fearest, God, seeing that thou hast not withheld thine only son. In the New Testament, there's two commonly used words. The first is the word phobos, and it carries the meaning of fear or dread or terror, but also it can indicate a reverential fear for God. Vine says this, Not a mere fear of God's power and righteous retribution, but a wholesome dread of literally displeasing God. But there's also another word, dilos, which means cowardly. We read of this word in Revelation 21 and verse 8, there where John is talking about Let the fearful and the unbelieving have their place in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone. You actually see both of these words in Mark chapter 4. As Jesus is trying to, to prove himself by the use of miracles, him being the son of God. And he says to them, why are you so Fearful, Delos, how is it that ye have no faith? He performs this miracle, and in verse 41 of Mark chapter 4, and they feared Phobos exceedingly and said one to another, What manner of man is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Again, Mark 40, or Mark chapter 4, verses 40 and 41. We understand that that fear is a common part of our lives, but there's also a, a negative sense of fear, but there's also a positive sense of fear. So what can we learn from these words and the meanings? Well, here we can learn, number one, there is a fear in which God commands. There's a fear which God commands. That fear is the fact that we learn to honor and respect God. 
The wise man Solomon, writing of all of his past vanity or the vanities of life, came to a conclusion that he's trying to teach the next generation. So in Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 13, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole or whole duty of man, the King James says. Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 13. Allow a man to fear God and keep his commandments. The idea there is a reverential fear one who would look at God and hold him in honor and respect. The fact is that you see the work of God and stand in awe, that you would come before him and worship and hold him to the highest esteem of mind, that we can see that he is the greatest in all of existence. And we hold him to that. We keep his commandments, not because we fear or the fact is that we're afraid of the righteous retribution that will come down upon our heads if we fail him, but rather we do so out of respect and awe for who he is. But there's also an, something else we learn from this fear which God commands. We learn that such fear is the beginning of knowledge. Solomon once wrote, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Proverbs 1 and verse number 7. We learn and we grow as children of God. Not because we want to avoid hell, not because we don't, we're afraid of what God is going to do to us, but because of the respect and awe that we have for him. Think about when we sit in a classroom or we sit in an auditorium such as this and the word of God is being presented, it's being taught. The attention level should rise, not because of who's speaking, but what's being taught and the source behind that. I, I know that we, sometimes we have a certain awe for certain preachers or teachers. Had someone come up to me and said, have you ever heard of this preacher? This preacher, boy, he could lay it down. He preached for a solid seven and a half hours, never looked at a note. I said, what did he teach on? What did he preach it? Well, I don't know, but he didn't use a note. The idea is that we, that we, that we are so in, enamored by the speaker rather than the source of the doctrine. That's what causes us to pay attention. That's what causes us to maybe not physically stand, but standing in our minds in respect of what's actually being said, what's being read, what's being sung, what's being offered, what's being accepted. This is the type of fear that God commands, but also the type of fear that God commands will allow us to learn to work out our own salvation. In the sense that each one of us will take a personal responsibility of who we are in the sight of God. Paul said this way, Wherefore, my beloved, he says, As ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Philippians 2 and verse 12. The idea of working out our, our own salvation and fear and trembling is the fact that you and I, we look into that, that spiritual law, that spiritual mirror, the perfect law of liberty, James calls it in James 1.25. We continue to look and see who we actually are in the sight of God. And we do those things by our own account that brings us in line with the will of God. It's not something someone can do for us. 
but something that we must do for ourselves. No one will go into heaven riding the coattails of their preacher, their mother, their father, their grandmother, their best friend. They will go because of their own faith and obedience. And without the proper fear, this reverent respect all for God, demonstrated in your life and in my life, then certainly heaven is not going to be a place we will spend eternity. We desire to live with God, not because we want to avoid hell, but we've come to an understanding in this life that I cannot live apart from him. The fear that God commands. But there is a fear that God condemns. There is a fear that God condemns. A fear that God condemns is a fear of using our talents. The fear of using our talents. God has given everyone here who is of the age of accountability. In other words, that you're a child of God. That you, that you have rendered obedience to the gospel. For those who are of the age of accountability, you haven't obeyed the gospel. The fact is that you have the opportunity to do that very thing. The idea is that you and I can see the use of our talents is something in which God expects you and I to do. He's given us that that, that parable of the, we oftentimes refer to him as the one talent man. And a lot of times we'll refer ourselves to that. We'll say, well, you know, I'm just a one-talent man. But really what we're saying is I, I'm the no-talent man because I'm not using the one talent that God's given me. You remember in Matthew chapter 25 when, when God had given this man one talent that he could use to the ability in which God gave him that he took it and he buried it in the ground. And in verse 25, when the master came back asking what has happened with that talent, he says, and I was afraid. And I went and I hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast that is thine. But you notice what he says here? I hid your talent. In the earth. See the talent that God gives you. Talent that God gives me. Those are not mine. Those belong to God. Just like the five talent man. The the two talent man. The one talent man. The idea is that, that all of these things belong to God. And the ability that I have. I've got to use the ability. If I have the ability to teach. I need to teach. If I have the ability to sing, I'm going to sing. If I have the ability to walk, I'm going to walk. If I have the ability to visit, I'm going to visit. If I have the ability to preach, I'm going to preach. If I have all of the above, then I'm going to do all of the above. But one thing that you and I do not get to do, we do not get to sit back and say, I have no talent. If you have no talent, you say that, then you're limiting the power of God. It's the fact is that you need perhaps to practice the talent that you have or do some deep soul searching and find it because God condemns those individuals who do not. Think about this. What did he call this man? The slothful servant. And then the punishment for which he was going to suffer because he did not take what God had given him because he was afraid and use it for the glory of God. The Bible tells us whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do with all thy might, for there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave, whither thou goest. Ecclesiastes 9 and verse 10. But there's also the fear of moving forward. We might call this in our layman's term contentment. Uh, we're, we're just happy where we are. Or perhaps 
we know what's involved to go forward and we choose not to do so. Going all the way back to the Old Testament in Deuteronomy chapter 1, you remember Deuteronomy, actually the, the entire book is the second giving of the law of Moses. See, the, the entire Israelite nation has suffered and died in the wilderness. This new generation has risen up, and, and, and so now they're going to make a preparation to go out of the wilderness, across Jordan, and into the promised land. And, and so in order to do that, there had to be a restatement, not a new law, but just a restatement of what God had already given to them. And in Deuteronomy chapter 1, beginning at verse 22, Notice what Moses says. And ye came near unto me, every one of you, and said, We will send men before us, and they shall search out the land, and bring us word again by what, by what way we must go up, and into what cities we shall come. And the saying pleased me well. And I took twelve men of you, one of a tribe, and they turned and went into the mountain and came into the valley of Eskel and searched it out. And they took of the fruit of the land in their hands and brought it down unto us and brought us word again and said, It is a good land which the Lord our God doth give us, notwithstanding ye would not go up, but rebelled against the commandment of the Lord your God. And so here it was, all the evidence. He was reminding them, you remember those 12 spies? We went and spy out all the land. He said, you remember they went up there, but only two came back with a good report. And he says, and you listened to everything. You saw the evidence of what was good, but you chose not to go. There's opportunities before us every single day, not as, only as individuals, but as a congregation. The question is, how are we going to move forward? We're only going to move forward when we lay aside fear and put it in its rightful place, put it into the hand of God and allow him to turn it into faith because we believe him and what he's promised. Jesus said it this way, No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Luke 9, verse 62. No man having put his hand to the plow and looks back is not fit. Another way to say that is that that man is a fool. He can't be part of this kingdom which Jesus said it was his pleasure to give. We must understand that the fear of moving forward is condemned by God. And lastly, the fear of feeling insecure about our future. The feeling of feeling insecure about our future. Uh, I wanted to give you one passage. Look at Matthew chapter 6, and we'll wrap this up right here. Matthew chapter 6, beginning at verse number 24. Again, Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount said, No man can serve two masters, for he will either hate the one and love the other, or else he'll hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body, and what ye shall put on. Is not your life more than meat, and body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, and they toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which is today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe ye, O ye of little faith? 
think that we can see that faith is the opposite of fear. It's in stark contrast to what God has asked us to have. For without faith, it's impossible to please him. Hebrews 11 and verse 6. It's the type of faith that you and I say that with God, all things are possible. That's why we say our favorite passage in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 13, that I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. What are you afraid of? What are we afraid of? You know, we're about just in three short weeks. If a God allows the world to stand, the calendar is going to turn over to a brand new year. 2024. That boggles my mind. But at the same time, if the calendar does turn to January 1, 2024, what's going to stand in our way of accomplishing anything and everything we as individual children of God or we as a congregation? What is the one thing that's going to stand in our way from accomplishing anything that God would desire us to accomplish. If you missed this, then I need to start over. Fear. That's the only thing that's going to stop us. Now, there's some things that I'm afraid of. I've been trying to give up my entire life. But it's not going to stop me from going where God wants me to go. It's not going to stop me from doing those things in which God desires for me to do. And I know there's been times this past year that I've allowed fear to stand in the way and keep me from executing those things that God has given me responsibility. No more. Because the fear is going to be placed in the hands of God where he said, fear not, be not afraid. And I can have the type of faith that God wants me to have. That's for all of us. That's for every child of God. And you're special. Because he doesn't offer the world that. But he offers that to every one of us. While fear can be used in a good sense and in a bad sense, we cannot allow fear to rob us of our successes that God says that we can have. To overcome fear is a step toward victory. That's why Jesus, or John said, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. This is the victory that overcome the world, even our faith. 1 John 5. In verse number four. What about you this morning? Where's your faith? Are you living in fear and being afraid? Your faith says that Jesus is the son of God. Your faith will allow you to repent of your sins. Faith will allow you to confess the sweet name of Jesus before men. Then faith will allow you to go down into a grave of water in order to come in contact with the blood of Jesus that your sins can be forgiven you. But as a child of God, your faith will say, I will not fear what any man can do to me. As Jesus said, fear not them, which are able to destroy both the body, or destroy the body, but rather fear him, which is able to destroy both the body and the soul in hell. And again, that second fear is a reverent fear of holding him in his highest esteem. What about you this morning? Is your life what it ought to be? Are you living in fear? Are you living according to faith? We can help you. We'll assist you. We'll study with you. We'll pray with you. We'll take you. We'll baptize you. We'll do the things that you need to do in order to lay that fear aside 
so you too can live according to the glory of God in heaven one day.